Welcome everyone uh, to our live stream uh, behind the system. Today's topic is Token Studio for Figma Quick Start. Uh, in this talk, Eric, Eric Singhartinger will help you to create your first comprehensive design token system in Figma. Your host for today uh, are our chief evangelist, Mike, and myself, Robert. Um, first of all, we have some housekeeping. Uh, I already saw some questions in the chat, uh, but this session will be recorded and will be available at tokens.studio and on our YouTube as well. Um, you can use the chat to everyone uh, if you want to uh, talk. Um, uh, we At the end of the uh, live stream, we also have a Q&A. Uh, we have a very packed uh, live session, but uh, afterwards we are able to answer some questions. You can use the Q&A button and please check uh, if the question already exists uh, before you create a new one. Uh, otherwise, you can just upvote them. And after the talk, we can go through the questions um, uh, by upvotes. Um, please be kind and respectful. This is a safe place, so uh, uh, keep that in the chat as well. More information on this can be found on tokens.studio slash code of conduct. Keep an eye out on our channels uh, for future live streams. And if you have any suggestions or ideas, uh, contact us via support at tokens.studio. But before we dive into the talk, I want to pass uh, the mic to our chief evangelist, Mike. Uh, so, Mike, take it away. Yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, nice to see so many people here today. Uh, I see quite a lot of familiar faces uh, in the attendees list already. So nice to see you all here. Uh, as Robert mentioned, it's a packed uh, a talk today. It's a long one. It's a big one. Uh, so I don't want to take away any more time. So let's jump right into it and over to Eric and enjoy. All right. Thank you very much, guys. First of all, thanks to the uh, Token Studio team. For having me today very excited and uh, equally nervous because everything i'll be saying will be on youtube forever <laughs> uh, let's share my screen which is actually quite a good thing because um as mike said it's going to be a packed session you should see my screen now um i'll be scratching a lot of topics i'll be scratching a lot of common problems and pitfalls and um, there's going to be a lot of best practices and inspiration how you could create your uh first token design systems. So uh, my top, my goal today is not to go in depth with every single topic because there is simply not enough time, one hour, but um, my goal is to raise awareness for um, all of the problems you might stumble upon in your first hours or tens of hours. All right. Um, I think you can see my screen. Uh, here's the presentation. I've done it in Figma because uh, you all feel most comfortable there as well, probably, I guess. Um, what I'll be showing you today is this presentation, the beautiful diverse rainbow down there are the topics we're going to talk about today. Um, then there's another page that's the template page. <clears throat> I will share this page later with you guys so you can play around with it in the Figma community file. You can get a copy and then uh, including the to tokens obviously down there and um, you can uh, <coughs> play with it then. So here um, are the tokens, uh, obviously did it with tokens, also the presentation. And um, let's see. Yeah, that's that's it. I think um, there are, no, I don't think it's, it's definitely like that. There are a lot of links in there um, that might help you, um, a lot of sources and uh, some articles. So uh, there's a lot of information in there uh, when you dig deeper. So let's start right away with the intro and the self-obligatory or the self or the obligatory self-introduction page, that's how it's called. My name is Eric, I live in Munich, Germany, and I had my first computer at the age of 10, a Commodore 64. <laughs> um, then that, now you know probably how uh, much of a nerd I am. Um, since 1998, I did web design development. Back then, pretty easy HTML, CSS, JavaScript, a little bit of PHP on top, uh, and you're done. Um, also in 1998, started with Flash, beautiful single source of truth. Um, it even had components back then. That they were called movie clips, um, beautiful scripting, responsive web design, um, all in one tool, amazing times. Uh, then in 2008, um, I uh, moved to Berlin, did a few startups, crashed a few startups, obviously. <laughs> and uh, in 2018, uh, we founded Satellites, 26 people now. Um, our office is in Munich, but uh, there are several people working full remote, um, and we are specialized on complex enterprise development and design. 
uh, if you want to stay in touch, uh, Satellites, that's our company, LinkedIn, and uh, my medium uh, with also two more um, Token Studio articles. So let's dive right into the topic, design tokens so hot right now. Why? Um, basically or mainly because of um, everybody doing design systems, getting crazy about design systems, because Figma being the number one interface tool or becoming in the last couple of years, starting with multi-user, starting with styles, asset libraries, um, then backtracking, branching, and also version management in the enterprise solution, auto layout getting more powerful month by month. We will get auto wrap in auto layout in the next couple of um, weeks, maybe, or months. Uh, which is a game changer for uh, responsive um, web design. Then component properties um, recently, um, which made uh, the use of base components not the best practice anymore. And obviously the, the Figma community with a lot of um, white label UI kits and uh, white label, it's, it's, it's somehow the gold rush of WordPress um, right now is in the Figma community with um, creating white label design systems. Some of them are really, really good. So, um, and one more thing, um, uh, we will get Chad Bergman from Figma recently said that, that we are getting native design token support. So um, you're at the right place. Design tokens is a thing to stay. Um, but what are the current problems with um, tokens at the moment? Number one, um, if you're doing a design system, uh, part of it is a component library and um, uh, you're doing components and um, the components are already perfectly uh, laid out with auto layout and constraints and uh, component properties but the problem is um, every component consists of small elements like sizes and spacings and color and topography and those are not yet tokenized or systemized um, that's what our tokens are number two is um, design systems um, i think it was september 2019 when i was 13 and Android 10 came out um, and suddenly everything had to be in dark mode. So the problem multiplied by two. And then there are a lot of multi-brand um, design systems out there. Um, and the problem not only multiplies by two, but before eight or 16. So there's a lot of tokens. Um, there's a lot of um, different themes out there. And um, it's, it's, it's sim simply not really cool manageable without tokens. So um, how is it solved currently in Figma? You have color and typography tokens, which uh, natively have, are supported by Figma since 100 years. Um, obviously not since 100. How many years do you think um, it was? One, two, three, four, five. It's a um, decimal. It's not a decimal number. It's a binary number. So um, it's not one, two. It's four years. So nothing in between happened that much. I mean, there were effect styles in between and effect guide or guide uh, styles in between, but and but not that much more. And um, all of the other tokens are basically right now in the components themselves or in Confluence, which is never up to date, or in uh, Zeppelin or any, any third party tool. So maintaining your multi theme and multi brand design system is a huge manual process and uh, very error prone. But solution is ahead or solution is already there. That's Token Studio. It took me a long, long time not to say Figma tokens anymore, but uh, Token Studio, um, where you can systemize and tokenize all of those um, components like size, space, dimension, color, border radius, border width, and so on. So that's the solution. But uh, we are not the first ones to use um, tokens. If you go to your developer friends and say them, say to them, hey, we have tokens now, they will be saying, oh boy, that's an old hat. Um, calm down, young Palavan. Um, we've been doing this for over a decade now. So uh, thanks to that, and thanks to some very uh, early adopting uh, designers, we have a, a lot of nice token systems out there. And as a warm up, um, I want to open a few of them and uh, look at them. So let's look at example uh, for one example for Pinterest Gestalt. Nope, that's the wrong one. Where is it? Is it the wrong link? Hey, Amen. Oh, there's one link missing. So the first one was GitHub Primer, actually. But it's not there anymore, but I think I can open it back there. There it is, which is a very easy one. Um, it only has colors. Um, if you go to typography, there is no tokens. But here you can see it's basically colors. It's foreground colors. It's background colors. It's accent colors. And it's um, border colors. That's it for a GitHub Primer. And they are 
happy about it and happy with it and they obviously don't need more there is example the next example is pinterest gestalt i already opened that a few seconds ago um you see a very you see a lot of very nice naming concepts in there there are a lot of tokens they're using dash, dash syntax and um, they are very nicely readable they also have colors for or tokens for um, colors for fonts you can see some early naming concepts in there for font weights and um, even for space and negative space also um, the next one is uh, shopify polaris which is a very very nice um, nicely documented one um, you can see um, how they use the different colors and um, what is tokenized there you have an early peek into a very easy um, way of um, taxonomy like ui element here color roll and the state um, it's actually very good to study all of those um, before you start because there is a lot of very very good techniques in there and um, um, i did I, I studied a lot of them and um, it just gave me a, a very wide view on um, how to do it the next one and also the last example for today is material three which um, shows quite interesting um, or illustrates quite interesting what the different how they're naming it and what the um, different levels of tokens is, are there so here you have the um, value itself the hard-coded value then you have material design reference which is basically option tokens then you have material design system which is basically available in light and dark mode so it's your semantic level second level and then you have component tokens what is is basically uh, basically for components for the uh, floating action button sec secondary container color so what you can see here is that the naming is a little different for system tokens uh, the color is early in the beginning because you want to group your color and for component tokens you want to group them by um, component that's why um, color is um, at the last it might feel a little awkward at the moment um, or in the beginning but it will totally make sense um, once you're uh, creating your tokens but how do you do those uh, or how do you create those tokens so first of all how you start you gather all your components um, either from a design that you have or from a design system that you might already have if you don't have one and you want to study something go to material 3 or ibm carbon or one of the other very good um, design systems out there or go to my component cheat sheet which is um, available here as a notion page but you, i like notion because you can collapse and expand but you can simply copy this it's an uh, open link public link and you can copy it to whatever google docs or to text edit and um, you can um, sort your components why would you want to group and sort your components um, because um, if you group your components group similar components um, and find similarities um, this will also reduce the amount of tokens you need and this will um, 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 enhance modularity so um, for example, um, if you close your eyes right now, and um, you don't have to actually keep watching, um, so if you close your eyes or would close your eyes, um, you and you look at a website, uh, let's paint something real quick. Um, how does every website look like? Oops, go back there. Oh, there we are, right here. So you basically have your frame right here. You have navigation on top, maybe. You have navigation on bottom. Then you have content like text and images then you have um, buttons maybe or forms in general like drop downs radio buttons check boxes and so on and um, you even might have or very um, um, quite sure um, is uh, containers so containers are basically um, um, containments for smaller elements like content maybe a news teaser or maybe uh, a, a snack bar or an overlay or a model so in the end you will probably um, end up with something like this so we have your navigation you have your content which is actually like component but it's also very um, um, important for design tokens then you have selectables that's how i like to collect all of the interactive things like buttons drop downs radio buttons you could also name them interactives or something like that um, text fields are also interactive because they have um, different states and you can interact with them and you have containers which is um, which contains basically content and selectables and if you um, collect those and combine those um, it, it might be a good um, opportunity to iron out um, things where you say ah probably these things look a little different selectables i might to align them um, because they are all selectables and they signal the user that, that it's a primary selectable or a secondary selectable um, form fields are actually secondary selectables or tertiary selectables um, so they should be in a virtual hierarchy 
And um, why you should do that is fewer tokens, reduces complexity, <clears throat> reduces also visual hierarchies, and um, it lessens the cognitive load. And um, I don't know if you heard about cognitive load. Um, from my point of view, that's the number one KPI for usability and um, um, UX, because cognitive load may, may basically means um, it's, it's your memory or your patience. And uh, when it's full, you basically abort um, the user journey or you leave the site. So you want to keep the cognitive load um, low. You want to keep complexity low. You want to keep the visual hierarchies clear, clear, distinctable from each other. So um, you need very distinctive primary, secondary, and tertiary colors. You need um, maybe headlines, make them distinctive. So maybe you need H1, H2, H3. If you really need five or six different font sizes, you may be doing something wrong. Or headline sizes, font sizes, you will probably have six of them. But in the end, if you reduce complexity, it's good for your designers because they know what headline to choose, what component or color to choose. And it's also a lot better for the users. So that's step number one gather all your components. That's basically like the warm-up task. Second task is gather all token sizes. It's pretty, pretty um, tokens. Um, this step is basically um, a very, very easy task, a very one-dimensional task. That's what the, why the one trick pony is there. Um, got a little crazy with Figma Jam once I realized how easy it is to paint and um, copy paste it into the Figma presentation. I uh, had a lot of fun with it. Um, but what you will do here in this step is you basically collect all your tokens and note them down. So for example, we have all the sizes here. So you might be saying, okay, I have two, four, eight pixels, I have 16, 24, 32, and so on. You have different spaces like one, two, three, four, eight, 16. You have different colors, um, like neutrals. Don't call them black or white because it won't work when you switch light and dark theme, call them neutrals with uh, maybe a little bit denser in the very darks and a little bit denser in the very highs and maybe a 50%. So collect all the colors you need, collect your font sizes. So you need body text, large body, small, you need different headline sizes, line heights, probably not that many, border widths, probably not that many. And try to find um, minimum values, maximum values, try to find the quantity and get a feeling for the rhythm of so those co um, um, tokens. Are they linear? Um, on a linear scale, are they exponential? Are they maybe linear? Then you have a step, then another linear and another linear. So for example, let's quickly open it. Let's get away with this. Um, let's quickly open a text file and you maybe have two, four, six, eight, 12, 16, 24, 32. Let's see if this makes sense. So you go through there and say, hmm, I'm not sure if I really, maybe let's say you have a 13. So 13 is an obvious mistake in there. So you're going to iron that out and it will feel a lot better afterwards. And then you say, hmm, do I really need 12? I'm not sure. So you maybe could get rid even of the 12 and maybe even of the four and not sure if you can get rid of spacing um, 24 because um, um, as a designer, we like pixel perfect designs, but in the end, um, less complexity means that it's a lot clearer for the designers and for the users. So we, you will end up with something like this. And this is like a perfect example for an exponential scale. So next would be 64 and 128, for example. Other things, for example, like font sizes, you're probably going to be ending up with 12, 14, 16. I'm talking about pixels. 18, probably not. 20, 24, I don't know, 28, 32 or something like that. So there's no real, it's neither exponential nor is it linear. It's basically just best, best practice. Maybe there is even like a step. 48, um, where you go a lot of faster or a lot higher than with maybe 64 and 72 and then 96 or something like that. But the goal here is get a feeling, get a feeling for the granularity, because again, here, fewer tokens, less complexity, um, more distinct visual hierarchies, less cognitive load, same, same thing. So that's the first things you should do. It's basically like a warm up um, task. And um, I really suggest you do that in a text file because Text files are a lot easier to um, handle. You can simply drag around, copy paste. You have indentions for different, different hierarchies. And um, I suggest you play around a lot like I did. And that's the second link I will share. Also in Notion. So for so basically you, um, you go here in size. Don't get confused by these uh, values because those are um, the token um, sizes. So these are the pixels I might be using. Um, looks like a lot. So zero, one, two, four, six, eight. Then we have a gap here um, and we go with difference of four. Then we go with difference or steps in eight. And then we go with either, I think, 16 now. 
Um, you go, you do this with size, and then you do the same with space. I combine those. Um, recently, the dimension token came out, um, where and I really wanted to try or wanted to find a use for it. So size and space was uh, probably the ones that makes most of the sen uh, most sense. Uh, and the same with color and then border width and just note them down. So that's the second task. You don't have to know anything about tokens just yet, um, but do this um, task very intensely, intensively. And then finally, 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 after you're like, after you have the feeling that you're 80% done, then go to, so, sorry, to token studio and create your tokens. Um, because it's in the beginning, it can be quite overwhelming because the tool is so powerful that um, uh, text file is a lot easier or weapon of choice, whatever you want. So let's dive into the types of tokens finally, because previously you didn't have to know anything about tokens in the warm up exercises. Um, so let's look at the token types. Basically, there are three token layers. Uh, let's create a scenario. Imagine blue is our primary color. Uh, let's pick one shade. It's um, HSL 240, 100 in saturation and 75 in lightness. Let's call it color uh, core color romantic blue 40. Um, I, I didn't invent the name. It's uh, from a plugin, a fantastic gradients plugin called Super Palette. Um, what's core is basically your option. And um, then you have color, which is basically your type. Romantic blue is like uh, uh, the name of the blue, and 40 is the shade. It's if you don't know, it's like this one down here. And um, if um, and that's the option token. And then let's use it as the primary interaction color. So whenever there's a primary interaction on your on your page and on every page, there probably should be only one primary interaction. All of the other ones should be secondary or tertiary because every page should only have one major um, topic or one task you have to fulfill. So there's one primary action. And whenever this one appears, it's blue. So this is the semantic meaning with meaning to this color. And uh, that's the primary interaction color. And um, for example, let's use it for the primary buttons enabled background color. So this is the component token. Component token because we're using it for a button. Let's look into token flow. Token flow is um, currently in early access. Um, it's uh, also from Token Studio and it's like a very, very cool tool to get an overview over your to tokens. So that's the tokens I'm using in the presentation and in the template. Let's move away my picture here. And um, Let's search for something. Maybe button third series for starters. So that's basically my um, button tokens. Um, here you can see um, this is the um, option token level. So it's basically just color values defined. That's, our, that's the HSL values. And it's all electric sheep, uh, 30, 40, 50, 60. That's the shades. Then you have your um, semantic tokens. That's how they are connected. And it's basically uh, tertiary selectable, which is basically the semantic meaning of the button, unselected, enabled. Then you have um, unselected hover states, press states, enabled states, um, and then you have selected hover states, and so on. And in the end, um, you have a component um, in a unselected state and a selected state. And that's how you link all of those together. Unfortunately, we have ellipses here, but it would say, for example, enabled background, enabled hover, enabled border, enabled foreground, and so on. We will look at it um, in a second. That's the uh, old school way, or actually the best practice until last week when version 1.35 came out. And uh, then we got color modifiers, and then it's a lot easier. <laughs> Um, I was so happy when it came out. Um, so here is uh, the core values and there's our rom romantic blue 40. There is the foreground color for it. And if you look at the semantic token now, you only have a background and a foreground. And where do we get all the button states? Because uh, definition of ready, a task or requirement is never ready when you don't have to find um, all the button states. So your developers might get very angry. So here are the different colors. So you have Enable background and foreground and hover background and foreground and um, this one is still wrong. Um, press background and press border. And um, let me quickly take a screenshot. Going to fix that later on. So um, that's a lot easier right now. And um, that's basically the three layers of tokens. So we have um, simple values, then we have semantic meaning, and then we assign it to component tokens. That's it. Um, let's look now into the option tokens um, level a bit uh, more in detail. So um, let's go back to the, uh, to the scenario. 
let's call it core color romantic blue. So that's the option token level. What's the definition? Um, when I thought about a, a light metaphor, a nice metaphor, I was thinking about my dad's garage. Um, probably um, you have seen something like this, very neatly aligned tools. And if you go ahead and ask your dad, hey, what are the different tools for? What do you need a small screwdriver? He'd probably go ahead and say, oh, I need this to repair your watch, son. And if you're like using, uh, what do you use the uh, large screwdriver for? And you're probably gonna go, so this is for the truck. And uh, then you ask, hey, what are you using those for? And he's probably gonna say something like, yeah, for the bike or for the washing machine or for the car. Uh, same with those. And um, that's basically all the, the metaphor for your option tokens. So you have a, a, a set of tools or like tokens and uh, different tools for different purposes. Let's uh, read out the sentence because I worked a, a long time about it or on it, um, so it made sense. Option tokens are all options that could ever be useful in all imaginable cases in your design system for all brands and themes. It's like a toolbox with all possible tools in all possible sizes, but you use different tools for different purposes. So basically this is maybe your color tokens, and this is for watch or smartphone sizes. This is for um, desktop sizes, and this maybe is for uh, I don't know, smart screens or stadium screens, uh, um, very huge stuff. And these are color tokens, same thing. And um, these could be, I don't know, topography. So that's um, the definition of option tokens. Let's look at a few examples. <clears throat> Besides our, um, what did you have? Color Romantic Blue 40. We, for example, also have a Goblin Green 80, done with Super Palette, Furious Red 50. Then we have spacing tokens, space four, um, size 100, dimension 100, whatever that means. Doesn't have to mean anything at this point of, of the token state or of the token layer. Core border radius 50, radius pill. Everybody knows what the pill is. Um, maybe a very huge radius. Border width 40, font size 300. Um, I've never used the font um, size with 300, but it's basically um, just an, another type of scale. And then we have uh, t-shirt sizes, for example, paragraph spacing medium that's the examples so for option tokens good scope um, or good scopes are key um, how are or how can you do scopes let's move this a little bit to the side and uh, go down there right now to our core level so um, font sizes for example you could go ahead with font sizes and just um, enumerate them one two three four five six seven eight nine let's go down there to our core tokens and i did all three different versions you're probably not going to need all three of them when you're doing your own, but I wanted to put all the variants inside there. So um, that's the enumerated version. Um, four is basically, um, at, in this um, example, 16. That's the blue value in the bottom right corner of the little, uh, how's it called? Balloon? No, <laughs> I forgot. Um, Sprechblase. <laughs> info layer and um, if you want to if you need a larger font size you basically go one up smaller you go one down so this is very intuitive but you do not have a feeling what four is and you cannot be sure if i need five times or i need twice the font size so i go twice the value in this case it's working because it's a linear scale but sometimes it's exponential and for space for example it doesn't work because space is uh, not linear spacing tokens there most of the time uh, rather exponential. We can go in here. There's another example. So here it's 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, and so on. So 4 and 8, it's it's not twice the, um, twice the amount. But you could as well go with um, the font size enumeration, which is actually quite nice because it gives a good abstraction to the tokens. Um, the problem is limited expandability. If you need a font size in between here, between 3 and 4, it's actually quite hard to do. Um, so there's another option and, um, that's this one. And, um, it's basically, um, a hundred percent normalized, um, with, uh, 16 pixels, uh, 16 pixels is uh, one Rem. Um, I'm using here base scale multipliers. So whenever I change the Rem to 20 or something, um, hundred percent is 20. And, um, the advantage here is that if you need a 50% higher font size, you simply go to 150%. If you need 300% or 200%. You go to 32 and uh, the same downwards. Um, the good thing is nice expandability. So you can always, for example, put something in between here, a 525, if you really need it. But as we learned, keep the uh, cognitive load low and try not to use that many. But if you're doing a multi print design system, you might need all of them. Maybe not really all, all of them, but most of them, because you have smartwatches and you have smart TV apps and, um, and you're going to need very small and very high values. 
for font size as well as for dimension. Um, the downside of this is that um, it's not really intuitive what the values down there are. So this would be 87.5%, but I left the 0.5 out. So um, that's the downside of it. The next possibility um, would be, and that's a very limited uh, scale, basically for line height, for example. So that's t-shirt sizes, medium being the regular, and then there are smaller and larger versions. Um, it's very intuitive, um, but it's also very limited. So paragraph spacing is cool for it. You don't need that many. I'm not using, um, I'm not using uh, um, absolute values here. I'm using multipliers and I'm multiplying them with the font sizes because uh, larger font sizes need larger paragraph spacing than smaller ones. But um, t-shirt sizes are totally fine for it. And also for, if we go somewhere here, I think I didn't, yeah, align height, extra small, which is 100%, 110, 130, and for articles, maybe 150. So that's perfectly for t-shirt sizes. The cool thing also is that it's a non-numerical scale for numbers. So right here, if you say, hey, uh, let's use font size 16, you might assume that it's 16 pixels, but it's 64 pixels instead. And if you have like t-shirt sizes, you could never um, mistakenly say, okay, 16 or something, because it's um, it's uh, simply t-shirt size. It's non-numerical values. The cool thing about it also is that um, you also ha always have like a center where to start. To, if you're talking about selectables or buttons, medium is probably, I don't know, a smaller value. And for containers, for larger things, a medium might be a higher value. So medium is always a good way to start. Um, the last one um, is color, which is basically color ramps. Um, I'm using 11 colors here. You might, you can also use uh, 21 colors because I'm doing um, 10 steps, 20, 30, 40, and so on. But you could also go with 25, 30, 35, 40, which would um, maybe be even a little bit better just to make sure you have enough colors. And um, it's also good for opacity, but I decided not to um, put opacity um, in uh, the core tokens because it's just a one-to-one -one translation. doesn't make sense. Um, in my personal perspective, trying not to um, um, order something or just to say how it's done, but uh, from my experience. Um, yeah, that's about it. Let's quickly look at the values. So this is like the, the global scale. I also added documentation in it. Um, so um, some of the tokens, most of them, the first ones, they uh, sometimes have comments in there. So that's the color values, um, 0 to 100. That's border radius. Um, which is also based on 16, 100%, um, then border width, which is basically multiplied by 10. So this is two, this is three, this is four. Then we have box shadows, which is not yet tokenized, at least the properties. So you cannot do something beautiful as the type scale down there. Um, line heights, uh, t-shirt sizes, then font sizes. I'm using RAM here to be able to bump the RAM. And this is type scale, um, for example. So medium is 16. And um, the ML is basically um, 16 multiplied by the scale, which is, I think, major two thirds here. Um, you don't have to understand everything. That's what the YouTube video is for, because I'm obviously um, trying to pack a lot in there. But um, there's a good replay value in <laughs> Game Plus. Um, then dimension tokens and um, box shadow intensity, which uh, because on light backgrounds, you need uh, less intensity of a drop shadow to make it stand out then on dark mode. So I'm simply bumping the um, intensity of the drop shadow on dark themes. That's it for um, option tokens. You're one third a token specialist. <laughs> Semantic tokens, um, number two. Let's get back to the, oops, stalling. Wait a second. Time for a quick sip. Semantic tokens. Um, let's get back to the scenario. So we have our blue HSL value. We have core color romantic blue 40. And the, and the semantic token is the primary interaction color. Uh, what's so special about semantic tokens? Semantic tokens um, give um, hold design decisions and they give your core tokens a meaning. Examples are, for example, romantic blue 40 is our base color selectable primary background. Bloodburst 80, also a super palette name, is base color selectable arrow canvas. <laughs> Makes sense. Core dimension 100. Random number in the beginning is base size icon small. Core dimension 150, base base container inset medium. Font size 300 is our title XXXL. And paragraph spacing medium is um, paragraph spacing body. Makes almost much more sense now. Let's look at the token taxonomy. Probably you have heard a thousand times when your developer comes up to your table <clears throat> or huddles you on Slack. 
what's the hover background color of a primary selectable? And the answer in token could be base color selectable primary hover BG. So what we have here is basically the level. This one is um, either option, like core, or semantic, I call them base, or component, I call them com. And this is the uh, category, like color, size, spacing, opacity, and so on. Then selectable is uh, the concept or a component, which could be button or container or navigation or um, e-commerce or visualization. Then we have primary, secondary, third theory as variants, other states, um, especially button states, or something like weak, strong in colors or uh, um, prominent. And then we have the property, background, foreground, icon, text, and so on. Um, let's talk about some rules for those semantic namings. The first one is be explicit enough. So is background a good token name? No, it isn't. Um, is it, is uh, if it's a color, it's color have a background. If uh, you're talking about a text color, call it color, color, foreground success. If you're talking about a padding, call it space inset, space inside, space uh, stack. Thank you, Nathan Curtis, uh, linked here for the inspiration. I like the naming really much. So basically inset is uh, inside your margin. That's the inset. Then you have inside, which is basically your auto layout gap. And stack is basically outside um, spacing, which um, is, uh, is if you stop, if you put, uh, for example, buttons next to each other or uh, some kind of news uh, teasers on top of each other. So be explicit enough. The next one is be detailed or not. The easiest way could be um, to define a button in an enabled and a hover state with uh, three tokens. So you have uh, one foreground color for border, uh, text for icon, and you have this um, different uh, background colors for um, um, for enabled and hover. That's the easiest one, not really extensible. Maybe you go with the detailed one um, with eight tokens. So you have um, a distinctive foreground icon default, foreground text default, border enabled, background enabled, and the same thing for hover. Um, that's very extensible and very customizable. So um, I think it's in this case or in, in, in components case, it's um, very wise to be very um, detailed. So and then you have to think about what um, sizes, for example, or what tokens to define even. Um, button example, does a button have a width? I don't think so, because a button is always as wide as uh, the text inside. It has a left padding and a right padding, but it doesn't need to have a width. Does it have a height? Yes, probably. But what's the height of a button? That also depends on how you design it. Um, on the right side, we see fixed height. So your button is 40 pixels high. And uh, the text in here is uh, 16 pixels high. So the rest um, is, is done by um, normal math. Um, the top will be 12 and the bottom will be 12 only, equally spaced. That's if you go with fixed. And the advantage is if you, for example, have a, I don't know, text field here, let's make a chat. And you have a button here and the text field is 40 pixels high and the button is 40 pixels high and you change the font size um, it will still be beautifully aligned um, the hack version um, is a bit more flexible so the button doesn't even have a height but it has um, the text size of 16 and it has a um, top and a, a bottom inset and uh, it in this case um, comes to 40 40 pixels but if you enlarge the font size you will probably land with 48 and it's quite flexible and it will never look Awkward. So for semantic tokens, good level of detail. That's what we just learned here. And concepts are key. So what are concepts? Concepts are not, and that's how you should not name your tokens, HTML tags. Don't use H1, H2, H3. Use some kind of kind of abstraction because if you use H123, they might be different in different um, breakpoints and sizes. And developers will always somehow have a picture in their head how H1 has to look like. I think it's better to simply say title XXL XL to go with t-shirt sizes. Bold regular is also not very good. Component names on a semantic level are also not very good. Good examples are primary, secondary, tertiary, um, container selectable for large and smaller ones, or your preferred naming, enable success info warning error for states, uh, container and selectable. Again, let's remove this. <laughs> um, clear and cloudy, uh, which is basically if you're doing the game with white background and gray uh, cards on top or gray background and um, white um, cards on top, then for text, prominent, strong, default, weak, ghost, foreground, sur um, surface, and so on. So that's naming concepts. Um, and um, so let's look at some of those tokens. We're going to go over here right now. 
So that's the playground file, and um, that's how I did the tokens. So for example, we have size, semantic sizes, small, medium, large XL for selectables and for icons. Uh, icon uh, medium 24 of icon and uh, medium 48 of selectable. So a selectable medium button is 48 high and an icon medium is 24 high. So it's different sizes, but always a good starting point. Then you have spacing, for example, for selectables. So the inset spacings, um, you have inside spacings, inside a button between an icon and a text and the left and right um, icons, for example. If you stack them on top or next of each other, then the same things for container, inset, inside stack, same thing for page. Um, and up there is uh, web breakpoints. Um, that's basically the widths and uh, page inset is basically your margin and page inside is the same as uh, your gutter. Um, then you have different colors. Uh, foreground, uh, default, weak, clear, and cloudy. So that's uh, gray and uh, light gray and the white. This is basically light gray with white on top, and this is white with light gray components. That's probably not the be most beautiful design you've seen in your whole life, but um, I was just trying to build a comprehensive e an example to um, play around um, with and um, um, do some tricky cases as well. Then you have your buttons. Down here, you have content primary and secondary. The primary color of your brand does not necessarily have to be the primary interaction color. So for Coca-Cola, for example, primary color red is uh, red a good primary interaction color. Probably not because everything, every button you would see will be very alarming. So they, I think they're going with a mint or something. So this is just to make the point that it's not the same. Then you have, for example, your tertiary buttons, which has an unselected state and a selected state, um, for example, for uh, tab groups of radio buttons and with background, hover, border, and foreground, background, for border, and foreground, all the same, and the same for the enabled version. Then you have uh, secondary buttons. These use a little bit of color modifiers in the component states. That's why they are less. Uh, component states are down there. We're going to look at the component state later. And primary button, that's the most beautiful version I just showed you in token flow. It's done with only two colors, background color and the foreground color, and everything else is done on component level. Um, with um, tokens. That's about it. Then we have uh, border radius. I'm using a scale here to scale all, of, all border radius. So media max Saturn team, listen up. Um, Saturn is very edgy, put scale to, to zero and you have very edgy buttons and uh, or put scale to um, two and you have very round buttons. So for example, if we scale this thing down to, I don't know, zero, you can see that everything aligns, even the focus um, um, Focus corner multitasking, if not my best. Yeah, how it works. I cannot even speak. <laughs> uh, so that's uh, border radius. Then we have border width. Um, what's there to, yeah, titles is also very nice. Um, so for example, this is body. Body medium is uh, basically 16. These are the component tokens. Let's uh, look at them. Um, composition tokens. Let's look at them later. So I have font family, title, body interface, font weights um, for title, body interface, default, and for the bold one, um, line heights, um, font sizes, and that's basically one scale. So we have an, don't tell anyone, that's the H1, H2, 3, 4, 5, 6. H6 is also the normal font size for body text. And then you have smaller ones and larger ones. So this is like your large body. And um, then you have paragraph spacing, title body interface, beautiful semantic naming. And if you go up to the composition tokens, for example, you can see those are the body texts with 16 and 20 and smaller ones. And that's your H6 also with 16, font size 16, um, H5, 4, 3, 2, 1. In this case, in WebLite. Um, yeah, that's it about for um, the semantic tokens. Quick sip, and then we go with the component tokens. Right. Um, back to the scenario. We have our blue HSL value. We have option tokens, color, core color, romantic blue 40. Um, you have we have our semantic um, primary interaction color, and we use this for primary buttons enabled background color. That's the component token. Um, definition examples for our component tokens: component button color primary unselected unselected hover BG, which is you can be very detailed here. Your developers will be very happy when you're detailed because then they really know what to use it for. 
component um, text field color on clear foreground placeholder component on is also a very nice um, um, prefix to something to say something is on something um, then component text field opacity disabled and the end boss of all um, components the time picker or date picker <clears throat> you can use it for hours minutes drop down or something as specific as uh, um, specific as draggable selector handle foreground dragged state so that's the component tokens um, the cool thing is since version 1.35 um, absolutely gold we have color modifiers so we can reduce the amount of tokens and um, the, the, the cool thing is not even Figma has LCH color model yet um, um, the token studio already has LCH and the most um, or the best advantage of it is not only that uh, can it um, somehow um, show a broader um, color scale for um, than P3 I think um, and you have the you have maintainable or, or um, well, how is it called um, constant um, 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 ratio um, yeah, constant how do you say oh man I would like to do this in German <laughs> um, constant uh, contrast ratios yeah exactly so these are both um, lightness 40 and this one is 1043 and uh, um, the recommended or the recommended color is white and this one is 2.83 and the recommended color is black so it's not um, stable and right here it's very very stable that's the advantage of the LCH color model <clears throat> so whenever you have a color and you replace it with another color of the same lightness you can be very sure that it's the same aspect ratio and uh, contrast ratio is probably again double A triple A and definitely WCHG conform yeah that's it um what why use them to keep your semantic tokens clean and strictly semantic and free of components absolutely for developer handoff maybe our developers um, they said well I don't care just give me anything I'll work with it for re-engineering maybe but first talk to your developers about it how they uh, like to define those so finally let's dissect some component tokens um let's back get back into the you can move um, here yeah don't need the interface right now so right here we have our web light we have our colors up here and um um, this is the tertiary unselected and selected buttons. If we look at the default buttons here, we see that we have the mapping right here. Then if we're doing the version with a little bit of color modifiers, um, we do not, where are they? We only define three um, colors for background, for border and for foreground for unselected and selected states. And we're doing all of the color transformations right here so you can see for example the enabled border and um, nope the hover background color is a light mix the hover border color is a light mix as well and so on so whenever i change those buttons back there or those colors back there the component um, tokens automatically change and this is like the most beautiful version with background and foreground only if you go in here you can see that they are full of modifiers i'm not using lighten and darken because um, it's not really um, stable to do so because um, you need for 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 the dark mode you might, might need lighten and for the light mode you need darken so um, I'm using mix and I'm mixing it with the foreground default so for example if I'm let's zoom in here if I'm on light mode I want a little bit of a darker um, border color that's why I do a mix with the foreground color with the default foreground color which is black so it gets darkened and when I switch to um, dark mode right here um, I do a mix with the foreground color of that theme and that's the white color so it gets lighter so that's how you can you do it and it's basically then a stable uh, stable token um, what I also did is uh, special buttons um, let's look at them right here <clears throat> those are oops just move that this back right here what I did here is you can also not render only render to page but you can also render to selection so I'm going here I'm maybe selecting this one and then selecting special button and arrow and this one references the red here and if I'm changing it to success for example um, and apply to selection oops you select this one it get also, gets also green this way you can also reduce the amount um, of work you have to do but you can only render to selection this is not stable if you want to change the whole page um, 
but also a way you could do because some sometimes when you have a very major design system you're having one component per page or one component per file and then you can um, build those unstable versions of tokens um, or those constructs and then render to selections and then you have a lot less tokens because you don't need um, this for every single type of button you only need this once and then simply toggle on what you need um, changing this back no changing this back to the error state yeah that's basically about it um, I also just to play around with you I have background light um, then look at the borders and also look at the size I made it larger and rounder how did I do that oops apply the selection page apply now it's like everything gets larger the roundness also gets larger just by one single token um, and that's basically um, border radius multiplied by two um, the scale that scales any um, dimension token and font size I bumped it up to 20 so it gets larger and there is also a high con contrast mode mode which is only available since color modifiers and I'm simply bumping the multiplication of the um, of the color modifier um, so you get a um, better contrast on um, form fields and on buttons if I turn it off it looks like this right I think that's it there, down there you have text fields and radio buttons but I think um, you can play around it with yourself um, by yourself um, so let's get back to the interface on presentation so we are finished with option tokens semantic tokens component tokens last thing a lot of people have been waiting for multi brands themes devices sets um, the interface can be quite overwhelming at the beginning um, but um, it's not that hard once you get the feeling and uh, it's actually very very uh, cool because you can do so many things about it or with it um, the thing is if you're doing different themes um, for example Mercedes web light and there's a Mercedes um, um, dark then there's a car interface dark and light and uh, showrooms maybe for tv and watch app those are semantic token sets so these themes just put them in there and um, um, toggle them around I just I, I show you how and um, you need one token set per semantic or actually per uh, target device then uh, another cool example is media marked web light or Saturn app dark so media marked web light would be one then you would have media marked web dark then you have Saturn app dark and then you have Saturn app light um, so those so that's four themes and um, you're almost done <laughs> Um, so how how do you use those things on the left side um, up there this thing is called theme right it's actually kind of misleading because it's not really a theme you select I call it the super fast set switcher because the only thing it does it toggles these things on and off right so if I go for example to dark the only thing that will happen is it turns this thing on right I go to dark it's it's on and whatever is below um, of something will override the thing on top so if I select web dark it's overwriting the same names with web 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 light and it would um, also override core but core has different namings core is um, for example core 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 so it's not overwriting but those here are for example let's go down up to the colors where are my colors uh, base facing Colors. Yeah, there are. So it's base color and foreground default. So if I go here and it has the same name, base color, foreground default, it simply overrides it. Right? Uh, looking at the same at the moment because it's brand dark and you have to select the light again. And then you see um, that this one is indeed black. Um, so that's what it does. Um, if it has the same name, it overrides whatever is um, more up. So basically, what you're doing is you're putting your option tokens. Um, on top then you're having your semantic tokens for your different brands brand a light brand a dark brand b light brand b dark then you have some kind of modifiers um, as I did with rounder larger high contrast Basically, maybe if you need different font sizes for a desktop or for um for a smart tv and then back there or down there you have all of your composition tokens um yeah that's basically it um I applied um the brand light now to this page so I'm going to switch back to presentation 
wait for a second, here we are again. So um, again, you can create hierarchy, um, but sometimes hierarchy is overwhelming, for example, and especially for button states. So let's move this around. I'm using also dash syntax and dash syntax creates longer names, um, but it doesn't create hierarchy. And it's sometimes even better readable and better comparable than creating too much hierarchy. Last thing, styles. Um, in the beginning, um, used in this template, uh, play around without creating styles. Otherwise, it's very likely that you run into the apply selection doesn't work because styles are a token problem. You can search for it in the Slack channel of uh, Token Studio. There are like a hundred threads about it. Um, later on, create your styles, uh, color topography shadows, explore Token Studio free and pro features um, like themes, um, which will create Figma style references and you have like a source um, 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 design system library and you can also uh, have consuming uh, Figma files that then reference the color styles and the topography styles and not everybody needs their needs to have the token uh, studio pro and at last decide um, who in your design system team really needs token studio pro and free and um, maybe who doesn't need token studio at all because in the end if your design system designers have pro um, your design system consumers and your um, designers that are simply putting pages together um, actually only need topography, outer spacing, color, and the components themselves. Um, yeah, I think we're almost done. Wrap up, start with text until they have a very clear picture of all of your components and tokens. Only then create option tokens with good minimum maximum values, quantity, granularity, exponential linear in the right scopes. Cre create semantic tokens using concepts, create component tokens, maybe using color modifiers to make your semantic tokens even clearer and um, come work with us at satellites if you are or want to become a kick-ass designer or developer <laughs> a mandatory hiring page thank you wow thank you eric very cool yeah more than a quick start it was almost a master class eric uh, great talk uh, <laughs> thank you i'm sure you haven't been able to follow the chat but a lot of people found this really yeah. meaningful um also i think we perfectly wrapped it up in an hour. So um, Robert, do you want to dive into the Q&A? Yeah, let's do that. Um, let's do uh, uh, dive into the questions uh, via the upvotes. Uh, the first question we have, uh, let me click on answer live. What is the best approach to solve light and dark mode themes? Do you prefer having all the designs in one file? Um, I mean, there's design, I mean, no, probably not, because you have a design system file, I think, and then you have your layouts. And um, um, I mean, it depends basically on the on the, uh, the size of your design team. Um, if you have a very small design team, or if it's only you, you can put it all in one um, page and uh, or in one file and create pages. And normally, I would suggest to create one page per component to have the component in there, to have the documentation in there. And um, then putting also the designs in there or like the, the real pages in there might get a little overwhelming. Um, also, it's not really expendable or extensible. So I would probably go rather with um, creating one design system file with one component each page and then create one or two or three. I mean, it's going to be a lot later on if you have like the normal page, then you have special pages and then you have like an, a watch app and a mobile app, smartphone, desktops. You probably want to have one file per, I don't know, device. That's what I would recommend. All right. Thanks for that one. Um, I think we can just follow up with the next question from Danny. Um, any guidance on creating tokens uh, that connect to both a web design system uh, plus a native mobile design system, specifically uh, utilizing Material plus Flutter? Um, I think that's not really a question of um, Token Studio because um, um, depending on your target platform, you can use Token Transformer and Style Dictionary to, um, with some scripting magic to create just the token syntax you need in the end. Um, try to keep your Token Studio tokens and your token hierarchies and system yeah, not, not free of the target platform, but try to keep a semantic level and simply say, I have a smartphone. Um, um, I have a smartphone uh, theme. I have a desktop theme. 
And um, because in the end, Flutter might change and you might choose something else, React Native or something, and then you have the salad, you say in German. So um, I'd rather stick with a, a little abstraction and do the transformation for Flutter in a token transformer style dictionary. Thanks. You guys agree? <laughs> I see, yeah, Mike. Yeah, absolutely. Uh... <laughs> I think uh, if you're talking about native, right, that there might be some visual cha changes on the design level that you want to incorporate. So that might be an additional set on top of your components. Uh, and then, yeah, like Eric mentioned, it's a style dictionary game. Uh, yeah, keep an eye on our Slack channel. We will soon be uh, releasing in beta a style dictionary configurator, which is basically a browser based um, click it together configurator so basically you don't have to write your style dictionary configurations and it's uh fully uh, uh compatible of course with with all the token studio tokens uh including all the uh, custom transforms that you would otherwise need to write for special tokens that are not supported out of the box uh, uh so i think it's another week maybe two before we will be releasing that so yeah uh we will make some noise about that on slack so keep an eye on that more information about that soon um, on to the next question from Regina. Um, I have observed that a considerable amount of design systems do not include component level tokens. As an expert in the field, when would you recommend implementing them and when would you advise against it? Um, I would always use component tokens, to be honest. Um, first, I thought I don't need them, but as soon as I introduced um, button states or like interactive states, you cannot go without them. Um, and it's also um, a rule that you should keep the semantic token level semantic and not component specific. So in on a semantic level, you shouldn't have components or, or names like button or drop down or radio button. Um, I like to use selectable and then like primary, um, secondary, tertiary, because primary, as I said, there should only be one primary action per page because there should only be one flow or user journey per page. And the secondary is gonna be like all of the form elements. So um, I think you should try to stick to semantic naming and not component naming. And then the problem is you might have something like a radio button or versus a normal button and a radio button has like a background and, and the little round thing on top or like a checkbox with a check mark. Mm -hmm. And then you need different um, component names and assign them differently from semantic to component. Um, and also hover and press states and focus states. And um, don't forget those. Those um, are not supposed to be um, assigned um, on semantic level. Yeah, I think another good one to keep in mind here is that uh, component tokens are really handy on the engineering side. Um, so yeah, I think Eric already mentioned it, but, uh, when you refactor your tokens, uh, and imagine you have semantic tokens implemented on your components, uh, and you do, you do a name change there, right? Every component that in, that consumes that, uh, token, you will now have to refactor it both in your Figma file, uh, which, which the plugin, uh, facilitates, uh, with some automation to an extent, but you'll also have to go back to engineering and say, hey, on these 15 components, can you please update the token now? Which means that, you know, there's an engineering <laughs> effort that has to go into it. But if you have your component tokens already integrated on your components and you do a refactor on your tokens, all you have to do really is relink them uh, and the engineering piece is done uh, automatically. So I think that's a huge advantage, especially when you're in the early days of your design system, your tokens are still volatile, uh, but component tokens bring a level of stability uh, uh, to, to your system. Yeah, I just read, um, for... oh. I just read about gradients. Gradients are in there, and um, I also tokenized um, the angle, which is here. And what you can do is another nice trick. Um, the angle is down here because it's another, it's, it's another token. The, no, the names here are totally irrelevant. Um, you can um, put in there whatever you want. The section is the one that's important because right here that the type is defined. So for example, if you go up here, the type is um, set because of the color here and it only accepts hex colors or color gradients. So what I like to do is um, I like to name um, the um, um, tokens where they belong to. So this is base color gradient ang angles 
And uh, so in the JSON file, they will be sorted right in here, like base color gradients. And in the JSON file, you will find um, uh, the angle here. And if I change the angle, also the um, angles of the gradients um, will simply change. So if I change this, for example, to, I don't know, uh, 75 degrees or 135 degrees, you can see um, that they are changing the gradients. And if you go into the um, JSON file here, gradients, so you have all of your gradients here and proof of concept, don't let me down, angle, where is it? Yeah, it's right here, right? So everything is needed to sort of knit together. Right, next question, sorry about interrupting. No problem at all. Just needed to find the unmute button, but uh, thanks for the elaboration. <laughs> uh, next question from David. Um, how do you deal with text hierarchy tagging, uh, H1, H2, H3, etc.? Would you document those out or uh, are simply uh, or simply allow the developer to cover that? Um, I'm using t-shirt sizes and um, um, because medium is always a very nice um, way to start. So if, if you use medium, you know it's going to be body text and larger value is going to be um, headlines probably. And um, I'm not um, using H1, H2, H3. Um, I mean, there has to be some kind of translation in the end for your developers because of uh, SEO. So you need an H1 to somehow that the, the page is uh, probably properly. But um, where would I do that? Yeah, in the end, um, probably um, H1, H2. I don't know, maybe, maybe in... Yeah, good question. Is it Mike, Robert, never thought about this. I think we just solved it mm -hmm. in our conversation and said XXXL is the largest one. So it's, I mean, every page should by default have an H1. So the largest token size available is always H1, depending on the, on the, on the um, output size. Yeah. Yeah. To be honest, also, uh, if you're, if you're looking at the tags in HTML, for example, right? Uh, it's probably always better to have the the size uh, uh, and and the actual tag separated uh, because you you might want to give a different tag a different size depending on 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 where you're using it. There can also be SEO considerations. So a lot of systems actually have the sizing of the of the heading independent from the from the tag. Maybe the tag by default in the styles has uh, a particular token attached, but usually there's also a prop on it that allows you to uh set the size of an h h2 for example to h1 or h3 right depending on how you want it uh and, and compared to seo for example or whatever other structure you want to achieve so that's also something to consider good all right Just, thank uh, you. going through the comments thank you guys <laughs> <laughs> yeah there are a lot of positive comments so uh, you yeah. did a good job yeah. um Let's go over to the next question from Kai. Uh, is atomic design suitable for grouping components? Yeah, why not? I mean, um, um, I like to use selectable and containers, but containers are actually organisms and um, molecules, maybe. And um, atom and uh, atoms are basically your um, selectables. But yeah, you could rename them, no problem. But thing the thing is, you have your atoms, which are your components. And then you have your, your molecules and organisms, which are probably your the a combination of your components, right? So yeah, but it would work. All right, thanks. Um, over to the next one from Tom. How do you manage base tokens, utility, um, semantic tokens, and component tokens when developers are using Tailwind, CSS, utility, classes only? utility classes only, sorry, and don't care about aliases? Um, I try to answer that and maybe Mike or Robert can give a better answer. Same thing as with Flutter. I try to keep it semantic and abstract in here and um, then um, export it depending on, like with script magic um, to um, yeah, Tailwind and so on. Yeah, we do have some uh, examples for Tailwind in our uh, repository, so you could check those out. Uh, maybe Robert, if you after this can in, find the link for that. I don't have yep. it handy right here. We'll look it up. Uh, but yeah, also uh, added to this, have a good talk with your developers, right? Because when you're using a framework uh, or a library like Tailwind, uh, 
yeah, it, it probably takes some time to figure out what is the best workflow that works. Uh, um, but yeah, it, it, it poses some restrictions, but there's, there's many users in our community that use Tailwind uh, in combination with Token Studio. So um, this would also definitely be a great question to put in our Slack uh, and get in touch with some other users who have gone through this process before. All right, thanks for that one. Um, let me check the next one from Onir. What is the best practice for responsive dimension tokens? There are uh, the two methods I know uh, I know of. Uh, switching between sets with mm -hmm. identical uh, token names and overriding either specific tokens or factor tokens. Um, not ideal having to deal with uh, apply to selection can be a hassle. And the second <laughs> one is... <laughs> and the second one... Added, um, yeah, I think... I mean, responsive, um, um, if we're talking about smartphone to tablet to desktop breakpoints, actually, um, I think most of them are the same, right? Because you're atomic on atomic level and component level, all of your components stay the same. You don't need different tokens. Then you have your organisms and molecules, which are basically cards or like overlays and stuff like that, which probably will also not look very differently. Sometimes you reduce the maximum font sizes of um, 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 of H1 and H2 on, on mobile devices, but a lot of it is similar and a lot of it is due, flex due to flexible layout and um, um, it's, it, it's basically all the same. I mean, if we're talking about a, a smartwatch app or like a very, very large smart TV screen, yes, I would absolutely override. Um, that's what the themes are there for it, but um, it's, I cannot think of that many tokens I would override um, between a um, mobile and a desktop, maybe the, the, the font sizes, but you could do that with a modifier, like with uh, um, something like rounder or high contrast, and then just override XXXL and XXL. <clears throat> Other than that, it's like components are auto layout and constraints, and yeah, we will get auto wrap soon, so less of a big deal. What was the second part of the question? Yeah, uh, the, these were uh, the two methods he knew of, but I think you already answered uh, the question. So okay. I think we can go over to the to the next one. Otherwise, uh, uh, you can just uh, visit us at the uh, at the Slack channel uh, to uh, if you have more questions about that. Yeah, I have one thing to add here, Robert. Um, actually, there is someone in our community. His name is Marco Kren. Uh, I know uh, very soon during a Into Design Systems meetup, he's actually talking about this extensively we're actually working together on on a design system gig where we're dealing with a lot of uh different sizes and and breakpoints uh scales um densities um and he's done a lot of work on this uh it's a physical meetup but uh i know that he's recording a video so we will post that on our slack uh once that's released uh in a couple of weeks i think so i think that will be a great one to watch in this context Cool. Thanks for that one. Uh, on to the next one from Claire. Is it better to have a single file for tokens or multi-file? For the tokens, yeah. uh, one file, absolutely. Yeah. And depending on the size, and I mean, if how for how many um, 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 target devices you're designing, you might have different um, design system source files, especially if you're um, 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 publishing libraries. You're publishing one per theme, like for example, uh, Mercedes Web Light and Mercedes Web Dark, and you publish those and um, the consumers will simply toggle on those um, themes in, in, in Figma and their consuming files. But um, I would absolutely only recommend one token file because overwriting is not possible with several ones. Yeah, I think there might be a slight uh, uh, misperception of the question because I think, um... Uh, one, one of the comments on that as well is about getting problems when there's more than 30,000 lines of tokens <laughs> in single JSON files. So I think this might pertain to the single file or multi-file sync, right, that, they, oh, okay. that we have in the plugin. Mm -hmm. uh, so you'll have one, one token file uh, or, you know, one consolidated uh, uh, mm -hmm. multiple sets of token in the plugin. Mm -hmm. But when you sync it to your repository, uh, there's actually many advantages to have multi-file as a setup um so uh um, also especially if you think about multiple people working on on the tokens 
uh, uh, working on, let's say, feature branches and uh, wanting to work with pull requests uh, later, merging things in, right? So you would also be able to avoid merge conflicts, for example, when uh, there's multiple requests coming in. Uh, and of course, from the engineering point of view, uh, it might be easier when your engineers want to find tokens, right? If your tokens are organized in folders and single files, uh, it makes it a lot easier to actually find the file there because you will find it the same way as you can find it on the left panel uh, in the plugin. Uh, so that's an advantage as well. Um, so yeah, I think uh, uh, that there's no particular pro and con of working with a single file or multi-file, but especially when your sets get larger or when there's more people working on the project, uh, I would definitely recommend going with the multi-file sync. So I'm not sure uh, if, if this answered the question, but you can always post a follow-up in the chat, Claire. Thanks, Mike, for extra elaborating that one. Um, let me see. Uh, let's grab this one. From Kevin, uh, how long does it take to populate Token Studio in the way you demonstrate? If if multi brand, does this time lessen? How much time so, does it take to do what? To uh, uh, to uh, to uh, populate uh, a file like you just uh, showed us uh, in the presentation, and uh, will this time be less for the, for a multi brand setup? That's what I think. This is a very very small file. Uh, so it goes relatively fast. I think it got significantly faster somehow since yesterday. Um, but um, yeah, switching themes could take, I don't know, maybe up to a minute or something, or even longer, and depending. On actually size. populating the whole file with all the tokens, etc. because I think he's referring to that. Yeah, in terms of creating the token structure, I think that's the, what the question is about. Oh, this? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I changed this a lot. I mean, creating it, if you know what you're doing and if you're like a very um, good text file that is like 90% of where you want to go, creating all of those tokens, um, I didn't create all of them in here, like the gradients I created with Super Palette and imported them. And those, um, so I created some of them. Sometimes I just copy this JSON, and put it into VS Code or another code editor and then copy paste. Um, but it would take a couple of hours, I think, maybe like two or something yeah. or three because of the, all of the mixed tokens, but it took way longer because I wanted to put a lot of different uh, techniques and variants in there. Thanks for that one. Uh, next one from Carl. Uh, you said that the brand tokens are more like semantic tokens in a way to be fully headless slash multi-brand design system. <laughs> Shouldn't brand tokens be on the end like one core, two comp, three semantic, and four brand? Yeah, I mean, if we're if you're um, talking about only one brand, you could put them in core. You could also put um, typography in core. But the thing is, um, if you're doing multi-brand, you have to put them in semantic tokens. And I think, I mean, no. For example, font. Type, yeah, font type you could put in core if you only have one brand that uses the same font because it's not a semantic uh, token. Um, it's it could be in there, but for example, if you're doing Media Markt and Saturn, Media Markt has a different font than Saturn, then it's uh, better put in a theme. But that's basically depending on um, if you're doing multi brand or single brand, I guess. Yeah, I think, and, and if I maybe interpret the uh, question a bit differently. Um, yeah, so, so I, I don't know if you're asking about the exact position uh, of where brand tokens should be or component tokens should be, right? But in the multi-brand context, also, you might have to deal with overrides on a component level eventually for a change. So depending on that, you might want to bring them up or down in the chain uh, because they uh, decide the order of overrides, right? So, here, um, yeah. but yeah, you could always move them around, right? Oh. So that's, that's the good thing. Um, so if later you realize that you need an override at the later stage, you would always be able to change the order and with that also change the override uh, priority. Yeah. Thank you for that one. Uh, next one from Ladislav. Uh, do you set token slash styles via the plugin or are you using the native Figma styles? I remember the Figma styles are not, are then not displayed as tokens via the debugger. So actually the question is, how do you uh, 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 set tokens? Uh, do you do it via the, via the plugin or via styles? 
um, plugin. I mean, you can do it both ways around. If you already have like a design system in place that uses styles, you can import them to um, Token Studio. But um, if you're starting from scratch, like I did in this example, I'm creating tokens. And in this example, I did not create one single style um, because there are a lot of cases where you don't need them. This is basically just for reassurance for designers and consuming files that they are sure they're using a, a, an existing style or an existing color. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not using styles in this file and you as you not um, zwangsweise have to, you don't really have to. Yeah. But you see yeah. them in spec mode. If you would have a, I think it's, it's a new feature in 1.35, right? Yes. That you're seeing in spec mode those um, tokens or styles. Yeah, that's true. So we're adding more and more support for styles. So you will be able to see them in uh, inspect as you see tokens. Uh, you will also be able to switch themes uh, uh, when you have only style, styles applied and it will still work. Uh, mm -hmm. So there are a bunch of new features uh, around this. Um, so yeah, that, uh, both, both ways should work really. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks for that one. Uh, let me see which one we can pick next. Um, let me grab this one. It's going to be a long one, Eric, so <laughs> please listen. <laughs> uh, from Kai, um, how can font sizes work as core token in a multi-brand environment? That's the short question, but uh, there's elaboration. <laughs> Shall I yeah. first share that one, or do you first want to uh, answer this? So. I mean, on, on the core token level, you define any font size that would possibly make sense for any brand of your multi-brand um, token system or for all of the devices you might eventually develop for. So very small ones to very big ones. So I think the scope should be just large enough on, on the core level. I'm just trying to uh, check the other uh, things. <clears throat> Hopefully this uh, makes it more clear. Uh, I'm moving over to the next one. Uh, Kai, uh, let us know uh, if there's uh, elaboration needed for this question. Uh, otherwise, we can move over. Um, I'm not fully understanding this one, but maybe uh, Mike can help as well. Uh, where can I find how to sync tokens to iOS and Android? Didn't find that uh, at the documentation. Thank yeah, you. so <clears throat> so this is again uh, a matter of of style dictionary, really, right? So what you want to do is uh, uh, first of all sync your design tokens to your uh, repository, let's say GitHub or ADO or GitLab or any of the other providers that we have, and then you have to build uh, an integration with style dictionary uh, to basically transform your tokens to a specific platform as an output target. Uh, and then from there, they can be consumed by your developers on every specific platform. You can decide to publish those as, an, as a package or, um, yeah, that that's really uh, depends on, uh, on on how you want to do this. And this is probably a discussion you want to have with your engineering team uh, to find the best integration. But yeah, style dictionary is, is probably the layer you want to have in the middle there to transform your tokens. I think no elaboration needed on that. Thanks, Mike. Um, I think the next one, uh, also one probably best answered by Mike uh, from Angela. Um, is it possible to organize tokens by folders, but not have the folder name be a part of the actual token name? I can answer it very, uh, this one very shortly. This is not possible yet. Um, do you want to elaborate on this, Mike? Well, that depends a little bit on what she means with folders. If you're talking in terms of folders in the left panel, those are sets. Those are not part of the token name. Uh, but yeah, if you're talking in terms of the tokens on the right side, they're not really folders. Uh, we, we open and close them like folders, but they're really segments of the token name. Um, so yeah, that, that, uh, that will be part of the token name as it is really the token name, right? So if, if, if you wanted to do something where where you were to create folders that are purely, uh, you know, for organization, but you wouldn't want them to be part of the token name uh, that is possible, but you will have to create a, a custom transform for that in style dictionary. So you will be able to, for example, ignore certain segments, but I would really not recommend doing this because um, uh, ideally you should find the token structure that really, um, you know, 
uh, from a naming point of view is solid. Um, so yeah, I, I think I would really recommend against um, yeah, trying to remove parts of the token name and, and purely having the names in there for organization purpose. Thanks. I think this uh, covers the question. Otherwise, let us know. Uh, next one uh, is from Ken. Uh, when creating the color palette from 100 to 900, do you suggest using uh, LCH and then dynamically generate the palette from a base color? I'm imagining some designers would like a more granular control of the shades of a single color in the, in the palette. Yeah, absolutely. As soon as LCH is available in Figma, um, it will be even more beautiful. Currently, it's open. Uh, it's um, available natively in Token Studio, which is absolutely blast because contrast, contrast ratios are very predictable. But um, yeah, in the end, you could even just simply define a hue and then um, um, create dynamic ramps with uh, dynamic saturation and light um, values right inside Token Studio and distribute those um, color ramps. Yeah, but soon as LCH is available, maybe even only with one color hue and then do everything from there. But actually, it's always a design decision also to say how dark is my button, how light is my button, how dark is my fonts. So you might need um, a lot of tokens and it's always nice to see them all out in place. And so, yeah. All right. Yeah, we're also almost at the end of time, I think. So let's do another two or three questions and then we have yeah, to maybe you can. Up. Maybe you can check which one do you think is the uh, the best one uh, to pick? Um, the available one. Yeah, you pick one, and I'll look for the next one. Um, I think this is a hard one, but let's try it. Um, from Ladislav, can you show a practical example of updating the tokens in a team and then updating it in in a file as someone else and using that update? Do you do you need to import styles again? Any common pitfalls? Um, no, I can't show anything at the moment. Um, but um, yes, I mean, I can explain it now, but it's going to be a very, very abstract. You have your design system file or your design system files. You have one token uh, studio file, and you have your design system files, and you apply your tokens to those design system files. Then you um, push you or publish your libraries. Um, with created styles and topography and on the consumer side you activate those libraries and then you have uh, color styles and topography available and if you're using the free version of token studio you also have um, um, themes and all that kind of stuff available and you're simply working with the components you have from your design system file plus spacing plus typography plus colors that's like the high level perspective i don't know if that was understandable but it's right. a very complex question, yes. Yeah, and yeah, I think this I think... it for now. Uh, I actually found a simple one over here by uh, Amir, I think. Uh, you made components submenu in the Figma tokens plugin. Uh, um, so how, how was that done, right? Slash. Uh, yeah, so you can use the forward slash when you create a, a set name uh, and, and that will create folders over there. It will also create folders on your repository with files inside of it. So mm. uh, yeah, that's how it's done. Um, <clears throat> oh, no, works again. Right here. Yeah, there's another one over here. Would you recommend creating a large base of tokens first, or would you recommend starting small and adding tokens as needed? Uh, I think the question was regarding option tokens. Um, I think the one I did here is a very comprehensive and extendable set because it goes from, I mean, from from as dimension tokens, it's or front sizes, it starts with eight and goes up to 96. That's probably enough. And dimension tokens, um, I start with zero and one pixel and go up to 384, which is almost like a, the size of a card. So um, it's always good to have uh, scopes that are working for, I mean, depending on if you're doing something for a stamp collection club here in Munich, it's probably not going to be have to be very big, but uh, for any brand, um, they might have a watch app or a big TV screen. So yeah, make sure uh, everything fits in there. Uh, all right. 
Yeah, I think uh, we've come to the end of our live stream in terms of time. So thank you so much, Eric. Uh, this was really a fantastic talk. Um, okay. Yeah, for all of you who have que questions that went unanswered, uh, unanswered, uh, I would recommend that you reach out uh, on our Slack channel and either ask the questions in the community or maybe Eric would be so kind to answer some of the questions uh, on Slack after the live stream as well. Uh, maybe yeah, also good to mention also good to mention Mike that we have a dedicated channel for the live streams uh it's called uh, called behind mm -hmm. the systems I will leave it uh in the uh chat uh so if there are questions you can leave them in there uh and we are also in that channel sorry yeah. for the interruption Mike go ahead <laughs> no no not at all so once again thank you everyone it was a great one thank you Eric uh I think everybody had a great time here today uh and if you have anything to add I see a finger over there yeah, that's mine. <laughs> uh, we will be sharing uh, these, uh, the Figma file together with the tokens for you to play around uh, in the Figma community. We will post the link um, in Slack. And um, for all the questions, I'll probably be answering them tomorrow. I'm going to grab a few drinks now. All right. <laughs>